Well, let's take our Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 20. And uh, my text is from verse 1 down to verse 17. And I want to speak with you about the Ten Commandments. I hope that any of you that years ago went and saw that movie with Charleston Heston on the Ten Commandments, that you can put that out of your mind because there's no comparison with what Hollywood endeavors to produce and what we have here in God's Word. I know there's a lot of debate about the Ten Commandments. Some will say, well, aren't you a grace preacher? What are you doing preaching on the Ten Commandments? Well, it's in God's Word. <laughs> and uh, I know others, when they read this, they, in many ways, try to set aside the grace of God and what Christ accomplished in that new covenant and bring us back under the law. As if somehow, you've heard me mention the ten-pronged whip with which preachers, some preachers, legalists, try to whip the people into shape using the Ten Commandments. But what is the purpose for these Ten Commandments? That's what I want us to see here today. And primarily how it is it that Christ has accomplished what is written here in the law. Christ said to the Pharisees, he didn't come to set aside the law, but to fulfill it. And of course, their problem was in their self-righteousness, thinking that reading these Ten Commandments, they were looking at the external and felt themselves, weighing themselves against themselves to be in some measure to be able to accomplish them. And that's when the Lord drove this home. These commandments don't just deal with the letter of the law. It's not just in word and deed, but the very spirit of the law. And I know people like to take these Ten Commandments and put them in their yard out front. I've thought about stopping and going and knocking on the door and asking them, do you realize what those Ten Commandments mean? Because in reality, every one of us stands condemned by what's written here, because there's not one righteous, no, not one. God never gave these Ten Commandments to Israel thinking that somehow anyone could keep them and thereby they would be saved. And that's the same today as I read this here, what we're reading. And this is why God gave his law. Three reasons why God gave his law. You can mark this down. One is to reveal God's holy character. So in these Ten Commandments, his law, and there's much more than just this. You could call this the preamble because even back in the day, whenever there was a sovereign that ruled over a nation, they had a constitution. And in that constitution, there was a preamble. And then as you read on, there were the conditions that were set forth as far as what was required of the people. And when it's all said and done, because all of the law is God's law, it wasn't that people should come away thinking, oh, we could do this. The more, in fact, Paul said that, the law was added that sin might abound. So if there's anybody that reads this and comes away thinking somehow, we're good, we got this, then you haven't seen it how it is because this is designed to show us God's absolute holiness, first of all. But then second of all, man's absolute sinfulness. Remember when that rich young ruler came to Christ and asked, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Christ asked him, so what saith the law? And he quoted correctly that the law said, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbors yourself. And the man said, these I have done from my youth up. Such was his presumption. And I've run into people that way. I'm doing pretty good on the Ten Commandments. 
And the Lord said, oh, if you feel like you're doing pretty good, go sell everything you've got and give it to the poor. Follow me. And he was struck in the heart with the thought of his own covetousness, which is one of these commandments. That's just one. It's like James said, you break one of the commandments, you broke them all. And it says he went away sorrowful. I tend to believe that that may have been one like Saul of Tarsus. Because in Romans, he wrote that later in Romans 7, when the commandment came, I died. What does that mean? That means the spirit of God brought it home. And wherein he thought he was doing a pretty good job, suddenly now he saw himself as nothing but sinful. And I believe that's why when he said, well, if we're under the new covenant, why do we go back to the old covenant, the law? Well, because in it is declared God's holiness. And in it is declared our sinfulness. And we need to be reminded of that every time we open this book. Because we're proud preachers. We soon forget. But the part that I see in this where there's hope is that these Ten Commandments point us to another. That there would be that one who would come in the fullness of the time set forth by God and that he would redeem those that what were under the law that this very law condemned and that he would give us his spirit to be able to cry abba father so as we read these yes we're going to see god's absolute holiness we're going to see our absolute sinfulness not just this sin and that I dare say that by the time we're done reading this, every one of us would have to say, there's not one of these that I've ever kept from my youth up. But the hope is that this law was given. It was given until Christ would come and he would fulfill it. And what a joy to read these and see in Christ the substitute how he satisfied the law in all things. So here we go. First, it begins here with verse one, and God spake all these words. A lot of times we think that this was just given to Moses, but it would have been spoken in the ears of the people because the previous verse and the previous chapter that when Moses came down from the mountain, it says, so Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. And what did he speak unto them? Thus saith the Lord. So let's remember here that this is God who is giving his word. And he says unto them, and this is the preamble. This would be like that covenant that was being established with his people. And the very first thing is, I am the Lord thy God. There were two tables of stone, remember? On the one side were those things pertaining, pertaining to God. And as we read this, there were four particular commandments that were given to them as far as approaching God and the worship of God. And then six of the commandments have to do with loving your neighbors yourself. And so he begins here with, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. There he takes them back to the Passover and how it was that they were even a people set apart under the Lord. It is he that had brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And with that word brought is understood bought. In other words, when the Passover lamb was slain, it was there and by that that the Lord then could Deliver them, bring them out. All of this is a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you take the time, and I've written these down, and it would be a whole study in of itself. When people say, well, we're no longer under the law. That's the old covenant. You can actually take every one of these scriptures here and go to the New Testament. And by comparison, the same instruction is given with regard to the church. No difference. Every one of these. When people say to me, well, we're not 
bound by the Ten Commandments. Well, what, which one of these then are you not bound to obey? You think it's fine then because Christ has fulfilled it that now we, we no longer have to give God all the glory that we can worship however we want to? You're fooling yourself if you think that. This is God's word. It's not binding in the sense of a legalistic, if you don't do this, then you, you'll not be saved. No. Again, in the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, Galatians 4.4, 4, made under the law, that he might what, redeem us from under the law. But even as Robert was reading there in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that we don't follow God now with rules or regulations written on tablets of stone. But what was it that you read there? That it's been written on the heart. That's the new covenant. That these very things now are written on the heart of those that are the Lord's. And why would I, being one that's been brought out of the land of Egypt, in the sense of being made free now from that bondage, why would I think now that somehow I'm free to live however I would desire? No, I, the heart, the Lord brings us to bow to him as God, very God. In fact, I dare say to you, and I know that this has been written on the hearts of those that the Spirit has so taught, but the Lord himself, the Word himself says that it's there in Romans chapter 2 and verse 15, if you'd like to look there briefly. There is a sense in which this law is on the heart of even those who are unregenerate. In other words, God has made sinners, and even though they're depraved and fallen, yet they have a consciousness of these very laws that are described here in Exodus chapter 20, in Romans chapter 2 and verse 14, for when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. These having not the law are law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. Their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts that mean while accusing or else excusing one another. You can go into the most remote place or you can even go here if you find somebody that's never been exposed to the word and ask them, is it okay for someone to murder someone? What are they going to tell you? No. Is it all right to go commit adultery with your wife? Well, absolutely not. They may never have read this word, and I found this back in the, some of the remotest places in, in the world where I've gone and preached and asked this question, even as I'm endeavoring by God's grace to give them an understanding of who God is and his holiness and justice. You can ask them these very questions and they'll tell you, no, it's not, it's not right. And you have laws that deal with any that do, oh yeah. And they've never been exposed to this word. That's what Paul is speaking of there when he says that by nature they do the things contained in the law. But it takes more than that, doesn't it? It takes the Lord by his spirit revealing Christ in them. I read recently a book by an author that described that when Adam fell, he actually broke all ten of those commandments that hadn't had him been given yet. Did he not violate this very first commandment here where it says, I'm the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me in verse three. Well, yeah, he, he looked at that tree of knowledge, good and evil. That, that was a God unto him. So he violated it right from the beginning, even though these 10 commandments had not yet been given. When it says in verse four, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or 
that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. That's what he did. He saw that the fruit was good. And that image of that tree that he saw should be satisfactory, even though he had the tree of life. He created in his mind. See, when it says here, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water and the earth, and thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. That's what he did. That image of that of knowledge of good and evil became for him something far more significant than even the, the tree of life, and thereby he fell. And did he not then take the name of the Lord God in vain, even as it says here, for I, the Lord, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. It doesn't mean simply swearing, but to disbelieve God is to take his name in vain. To read this word in any way and minimize what God has declared of himself. Again, in this matter of holiness, we have no clue what it is for God to be holy. But even more so, we have no clue what it is to be a sinner apart from the spirit of God. And we justify ourselves in that sin. That's to take the Lord's name in vain, even in doing that. To minimize what he has declared. And particularly pursuing any other way in coming to God other than through the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can see that this is how God reveals himself. It says in verse 5 there, he's a jealous God. That he does not have any rivals, that he will not give his honor to any other. And visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Some people find fault with that. They say, well, how come God visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the children? Well, that's what he did in Adam. That when Adam fell as the representative, as our father, that that iniquity was visited upon us as his children by imputation. That's why we're born in this world sinners. We're sinners by nature, but we're sinners by and by birth and practice. Some people say, well, I, I don't see why I should be blamed for Adam's sin. Well, then stop sinning. If you just, you're propagating it. You are what you are as a sinner. You don't even have to go all the way back to Adam. We know that we're sinners because of Adam, but we know we're sinners because of our own practice. That's who we are. And, and what I want us to see here in all of this is that these commandments are given for those two reasons. I, I've mentioned this lawyer that it encountered Christ over in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 35. When he came to the Lord and asked, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Give us a sum of it. I love how the Lord deals with these that came to him. It says there, in verse 34 of Matthew 22, when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him. He wasn't really interested at this point in the answer, but tempting the Lord, trying the Lord, and saying, Master, even that expression was hypocritical. He was looking at our Lord is his equal. 
Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So again, what we're reading here as far as the Ten Commandments are concerned, it's the preamble. I don't know if you've ever gotten an insurance policy in the mail, but it kind of lays out the conditions at the front part, and then it's got all this other detail in the back. The fine print is what they call it. What we have here is the preamble, summarizing these Ten Commandments, but even as it says here, on um, these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Two tables of stone, the one dealing with what it is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then the second part of the, the tables of stone deals with what it is to love your neighbors yourself. I dare say we don't even come close on loving our neighbor as ourself. When was the last time you checked on your neighbor? And dealt with that neighbor to find out what their concerns and needs are as much as you're concerned about your own. We don't even come close there and even less now when it comes to this matter of loving the Lord, our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind. But I know one who did. That was the Lord Jesus Christ. For him to be the savior and to fulfill the law in every jot and tittle, just like it says here, on these hang all the law and the prophets. Well, that's all the Old Testament. But that's why it was necessary that he come as that last Adam and fulfill these on our behalf. So when we're studying and reading this, yes, it deals with God's glory and holiness, but at the same time, we can see how Christ satisfied every one of these commandments. He never, verse 7, coming back to my text in Exodus 20, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. He did nothing but glorify the Lord his God in thought and word and deed. Because the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. If it were not for Christ interposing himself and being that substitute, on this alone we stand condemned. He will not hold us guiltless. And my prayer is that as we're reading down through this, that we just see how glorious the grace of God is. That he should be merciful, where it says up there, showing mercy unto his people. Showing mercy in verse 6 unto them, unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Well, who's that? Who are the thousands of them that love him and keep his commandments? That's those in Christ. This is why I say that there are those that would diminish the significance of the law as if they can brush it off and say, well, that doesn't pertain to us. We're under grace. Well, we're under grace as far as the curse of the law, but the law has not changed. When it says here that the Lord had spoken these words, are not the words of God eternal? And therefore, when we come back and read, it's like David said, oh, how I love thy law. It wasn't because he thought that in any way he had kept that law, but I love what the law reveals. There was a day when I could not say that. But now... When I read this law, I can say I love the law. Why? For the three reasons that I told you that it was given. Because it reveals God's holiness. How do we need to hear that? I love what this book has to say about God's holiness. Not some God that's changing and lowering his standards so somehow he can save people no he doesn't lower his standard i love that standard of holiness now i couldn't love it outside of christ but i love how christ is satisfied and magnified the law honored it, kept it on behalf of a 
poor, wretched sinner such as I am. I love how the law reveals my own sinfulness. Without it, I wouldn't know, nor would I bow, but as the Spirit of God enables me to read these portions in the law, I can see my sinfulness, not just this sin and that sin, but the sinfulness of my sin. And that Spirit of God brings me to bow, but oh, how I love how the law sets forth the work of the Lord Jesus Christ that he should come and accomplish. There are some that say, well, there was no grace in the law. Oh, yes. One of the very first things after giving these 10 commandments there, in chapter 20 and uh, verses 18 through 26, what's the very first thing that God establishes? This shows right there that there wasn't any intention in God's mind that somehow this law would be a means of salvation. First thing he did was build an altar. When the people, in verse 18, saw the thunderings and lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountains smoking, and when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. There's God's holiness right there. That's why this law was given. And they said to Moses, speak thou with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. They're seeing something of God's holiness and they're seeing something of their own sinfulness. And Moses said unto the people, fear not for God has come to prove you and that his fear may be before your faces that ye sin not. And the people stood afar off and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was and the Lord said unto Moses, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I have talked with you from heaven. Ye shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall ye make unto you gods of silver. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon that burnt offering. There's the grace of God right there. All of this is revealed in the law, and that's why I love the law. I love to read along and look for these Scriptures that point us to Christ and to his death. The burnt offerings, the peace offerings, thy sheep and thine oxen, and all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee and I will bless thee. That's how he blesses. So it's not like God tried the law for thousands of years and since that didn't work out, well, let, let me try grace. No, the grace of God was always there. Go all the way back to Genesis. Noah found grace in the eyes of God. What was the first thing he did when he came off that ark? Offered a sacrifice. That's why the Lord purposed that there be those clean animals that should go onto the ark. That there might be wherewith they might sacrifice unto the Lord. So coming back here again to Exodus chapter 20, that's what we're seeing here in this very first part. How that they were not to make any graven images and that they weren't to worship or bow down themselves to them. I know there's some that take this to an extreme and say, well, then you should never even draw a picture of a cloud. That's how they, they interpret it. You should never draw a picture of a beautiful sunset because what you're doing is making a graven image. But the key there is bowing down thyself to worship. I thank you the Lord for beautiful gifts that the Lord has given to different artists to paint landscapes and other things, and animals and whatnot. That, that's not violating the law here. But if you took a golden calf and made it and put it right here and said, we're going to worship this. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> now we're dealing with what God himself has said, thou shalt not do. He's a jealous God. And I will tell you this, I grew up with different pictures and images that people use to try to portray God, Christ, and all these things. And I'll tell you, I'm still trying to get rid of those images. People ask me from time to time, well, do you know a good children's Bible story book right here? Just take this word and read the scriptures to them. If you're going to give them something to put their ears in, Get them listening to the word read before they go to bed at night. 
This is the image. This is what God has given us. His word begins with God spake all these words. That's why our Bible doesn't have pictures in it. Even Christ, had it been his desire to leave a picture of himself, it could have been done. There were artists back in his day. We're talking about it years before Christ came here. There were, there were these nations that were making graven images. But the Lord said, none of that is how you're going to worship me. It's going to be on how the Spirit of God reveals me in your heart. That's the image I want. Now we get to verse 8. People will say, well, what about the Sabbath day? Well, the Lord decreed there under the old covenant, six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant nor thy cattle nor any stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. That goes all the way back to creation. So you say, well, what about that? Well, again, as we're reading this, all of this was given to show us the rest that the Lord Jesus Christ would give in his day when he came and fulfilled the Sabbath. He being the Sabbath and that he is our rest. It's not in a day today. People ask me all the time, well, do you believe in the Sabbath? And they're usually thinking about Saturday. I know that some have transferred it over to Sunday and they say, well, that's the Christian Sabbath, it's Sunday. No, Christ is our Sabbath. And yes, I, Celebrate the Sabbath, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, because Christ is my Sabbath. It's not some legalistic adherence today under the new covenant. Remember again, read, going back to what Robert read for us there in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that those things were, which were written on tables of stone were but for a time. Let me, let's just go back and look at that, what he read for us because this applies here and that now this law has been written upon the hearts of those that are the Lord's I've been saying 2 Corinthians chapter 3 yeah it is I'm in 1 Corinthians 3 let's come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 notice how Paul writes this here to the believers there in Corinth, verse two, ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to God word. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of what? The New Testament. So all that the Old Testament had to declare now under the New Testament, we declare as being fulfilled in Christ. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Not for the letter what killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And then you go on and read in verse 7, if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious, more glorious? That's why I loved it take this, these laws and show you how Christ fulfilled every one of them. He said, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. There's no rest in putting you back under the bondage of that law. There was none that could keep it. They all perished. 
or even verse 10, that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelled. What's the glory that excelled? It's not going back and imposing the Old Testament law concerning the Sabbath. Don't even pick up a stick. That was the law. God purposed that they rest on that day, but it be a day of worship to remember the rest that God gives in the Lord Jesus Christ over in Hebrews chapter 4. So again, it's not that we're setting aside the law in any way by preaching how it's revealed here in the scripture, but rather we establish it and show how Christ fulfilled it. Here in Hebrews chapter 4, The writer says in verse 1, Let us therefore fear lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. As far as the law was concerned, they all came short of it. But he says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. There's not two gospels. There's not one of the Old Testament and the other of the New. He's saying here that the same gospel that we preach here under the new covenant was preached to them, but it was preached in type and picture and prophecy and promise. But there were many that did not enter into that rest because they didn't believe God. Ask that man that went out there, how serious was God when he was out picking up sticks and the Lord said, go stone him, kill him. You think, well, that's pretty severe. Well, the Lord said, don't pick up a stick. That's the picture of rest. And you bring that over now to the new covenant in which we live. Don't you dare with Christ as your rest, the declared rest that he's accomplished, go out there and pick up the stick and say somehow that's significant. Don't you dare come at in any way your work where Christ is, where God has declared it to be a rest. And in verse eight, it says, for if Jesus... Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Any rest back then was in type and picture and prophecy and promise. But when he says here in verse 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. What is that rest? It's not the rest of the Old Testament law that couldn't give rest. But here it is, verse 10. He that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from what his own works as God did from his. What is it to rest? What is it to celebrate the Sabbath today? It's not set aside, but it's fulfilled. It's that we rest in the work that the Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished. So you can see here, and I, I know we're just kind of skipping over the waves here as we go down through these commandments. But you can see how all of this pertains to the glory and honor of God and how he's purposed to bless his people when they honor him for who he is and what he's done and honor his son for that rest that the Lord Jesus Christ came and accomplished. And then you see here the last part of this portion of scripture. Now, now come the commandments with regard to loving your neighbor as yourself. The first part, we love God for who he is by his spirit. We love God for what he's done. We love God for how Christ has fulfilled our rest. But with regard to our neighbor, it says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. What's the one thing that Paul said that in the latter times, children would despise their parents. But what that is, is no regard for authority. It doesn't take much when that baby first is born. Looks so innocent, cute. Everybody's, oh, how precious. Well, give it some time. The very first thing it's going to say to mom and dad is no. And yet, this is the authority that God has established upon earth, just like he's established governments. There's not a government that exists 
a ruler that exists, but what God himself has an ordained, Romans 13. And lest any should think, well, I don't have to honor my father and my mother. I can just go my own way. Well, that's the nature of the depravity of the heart, to think that somehow I don't need authority. That's really what it is. But God has purpose that even parents be established. There's that authority that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. There's some blessing that's given here. And it's not just here. Remember, I said that every one of these, we can find the parallel in the New Testament. If we look over in Ephesians. And so when kids come up to you and say, you know what my dad did, or you know what my mom did, you guys, psh. You know what the, what the Lord says? Ephesians chapter 6, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. What promise was given? That your days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Even in the unregenerate world where kids have set off on their own and thought, I can make my life however I want to, the next thing you know, they're in trouble. They didn't heed the words. Like I told my kids growing up, everything that I'm teaching you here like guardrails. But if you keep bumping up against the guardrail rather than driving in the lane that is given you, then eventually you're going to end up in the ditch. There's going to be consequences. But again, how did Christ fulfill this? That's what I see. He obeyed his father in all things. He was subject to his earthly parents. There, at no time do we find our Lord saying, well, I don't have to obey you. I've, I've got my father. No. He demonstrated in not just word and deed, but thought what it was to be subject to his parents. Not just giving an example, but fulfilling the law. Because I, I look back even on my own life. In spite of all the good instruction I got, how much I kicked against that instruction. And yet, the only thing I can say is the Lord is merciful. And keeping me even through that. That's what I want you to see here. It's, it's not like this law has been set aside. These are how God has set forth what it is to love your neighbor. Your closest neighbor is your father and your mother. And the scriptures say even with regard to taskmasters, even if they are evil, you still you give them respect. Exodus 20 verse 13, thou shalt not kill. That's a specific word that describes just going out and murdering somebody. Well, how is that not loving your neighbor? Well, if you kill them, you didn't love them. And so, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. How do you love your neighbor? You just you don't go over there and take take the neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not steal. Same thing, taking what the Lord hasn't provided for you in normal means. We work for what the Lord has given us to steal. But there's, again, in every one of these, there's a deeper sense. That's why the Lord told the Pharisees there in Matthew chapter 5, you've heard that it's been said that thou shalt not murder. Because that's the word that's used. There is a killing, which is the taking of life legally. In fact, the Lord said that any that disobeyed, they were to be taken out in stone. So obviously, that's not what he's talking about here. The Lord has put people in position. And to execute justice and judgment, they, they're put to death. I know people argue against the capital punishment, but it's been in the scriptures from the beginning. But here it's in the sense of murder. And so the Pharisees in their self-righteousness were saying, well, we be not murderers. What did the Lord say? If you so much as say to somebody, Raka, you stupid fool. Well, hands go up guilty. Guilty as charged. You just as much killed them. You know, when I read these, that makes me see just how merciful and gracious God is. But it's not that he's looking the other way, because that's our nature. 
Here again, it took the substitute to come and to lay down his life. Thou shalt not kill. There's a different meaning to a deeper meaning with regard to committing adultery. That's why the Lord said to the Pharisees, because they said, well, we, we've not committed adultery. Our hands are clean. But he said, if you so much as lust after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery with her. Well, that makes all of us guilty. Thou shalt not steal. It's not just physically stealing, but robbing God of his glory. Anytime you attribute to yourself any works of your own, rather than giving God all the glory, you've just, you've robbed him. And then thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. See, all of these have to do with what it is to love your neighbor. And thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet a neighbor's wife, or his manservant, maidservant, or his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. Well, who can say they're clean there? The neighbor drives up in a brand new vehicle, and you look across the driveway, and they move. Okay, some say, they don't deserve that. Well, they get in their little beater and drive off. And all these things are dealt with in God's law, and again, to remember that the purpose is to show God's holiness. If, if we have to deal with God and his exact justice and holiness, who can stand? If the Lord should mark any who can stand. But to reveal our own sinfulness. That our mouths may be stopped. That's what Paul said. Why, why did God give that law in Romans 3.19? That every mouth might be stopped and the whole world found guilty before him. But oh, more importantly, to see how the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled every jot and tittle of this law to the satisfaction of God the Father, that he might be a just God and Savior. Well, we've just touched the surface, but we're going to have to stop there for today. I pray the Lord will be pleased to teach us of himself. All right.